Floods, fires, earthquakes, tornadoes, natural disasters. When these kinds of phenomena occur, they bring with them loss of human life, often on a massive scale. Tragic environmental devastation, plus destruction and hardship to spare. Arguably though, when it comes to man-made disasters, we have a different responsibility. Our focus for this chilling but fascinating episode of Desperate Hours is on nuclear and industrial disasters. Nuclear power depends on harnessing the energy released during one of two processes, nuclear fission or nuclear fusion. In both nuclear fusion and nuclear fission, energy is released from the high-powered atomic bonds between the particles within a nucleus. The nuclear energy produced can then be used to generate electricity. Ironically, nuclear power is a relatively clean source of energy, which is great. But of course, unless the utmost precautions are taken in generating nuclear power, then the consequences can go beyond merely disastrous to the unthinkable, the horrific. Fukushima, Japan, March 11, 2011. It was then that a terrible earthquake, followed by a tsunami, triggered a fault at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant to create one of the worst nuclear disasters of our times. First, a series of seven tsunamis, some as high as 15 meters, saw to it that diesel generators at Fukushima Daiichi were shut down. Flood water swamped the generators, causing them to fail. The reactors began to heat up. Even after a plant shuts down, nuclear fuel requires continued cooling, which would usually have come from water being continually pumped into the reactors. With the earthquake knocking out electricity at the plant, emergency diesel generators were deployed to cool reactor units one, two, and three. But only an hour later, flooding from the tsunami knocked out the backup generators. Its immediate impact was felt by tens of thousands of people with homes near the plant. With the plant's critical cooling systems knocked out, it set off a chain of hydrogen explosions in reactors 1, 2 and 3 and damaged the containment structure in reactor 4. 
particles from the melted fuel sent radiation levels dangerously high, to put it mildly. According to the Japanese Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency, the amount of radioactive cesium that spilled into the atmosphere was equivalent to 168 Hiroshima bombs. It must be said, the efforts of workers at the plant to contain the disaster were nothing short of heroic. In the aftermath of the tragedy, foreign media looking for a silver lining dubbed these workers as the Fukushima 50. なるべく戦力を下げなければいけないということだと思いますけど、ちょっとその技術的な問題もあるという話だったんで、そこのところはよくあの話を聞いてですね、なるべく効率的にそして戦力も多く下げれるようにということを考えていきたいと思います。And in 2013, the Tokyo Electric Power Company admitted that some 300 tons of radioactive water per day was still leaking from the Daiichi nuclear power plant. Nuclear power has been with us now for 70 years. It was developed during wartime. World War II, to be precise. With the war dragging on in Europe and Asia, there was an arms race going on, the likes of which we have never seen before. The Germans had the edge on atomic power, until the early 40s, when a nuclear development program called the Manhattan Project got underway in the US. Top secret, but backed to the hilt by the government, the Manhattan Project's goal was the development of the atom bomb. Most of the critical research and development took place at a purpose-built facility in the new infamous Los Alamos, New Mexico. Five, four, three, two, one, five. At 5.30 a.m. on the 16th of July, 1945, the Los Alamos scientists successfully exploded the first atomic bomb. Robert Oppenheimer, Enrico Fermi, and their team had unleashed the staggering power of atomic reaction in a way their predecessors could only theorize about. Less than a month later, on August 6th and 9th, 1945, the first atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They remain the only two such bombs ever used in warfare. Nuclear testing, however, went on for decades, such as the 1950s, when this footage was taken over the Pacific of an atom bomb detonated at Enwateca Atoll. With the end of the war, scientists also began exploring the peaceful applications of nuclear energy. Though strict security guards the Atomic Energy Commission's laboratories in America, newsreel cameras are permitted to report on how the deadly radioactivity of atomic power is being put to work, not for destruction, but for the benefit of mankind. The first ever nuclear reactor to produce electricity started up in 1951 in Idaho. The experimental breeder reactor was admittedly very small, but within a few years, the first commercial nuclear plants had begun supplying electricity to the US, Russia, Japan, the United Kingdom and others. But major accidents in 1979 at the Three Mile Island power plant in Pennsylvania and in Chernobyl, Ukraine, seemed to cast the shadow of doubt over the future of nuclear power. The very name Chernobyl has become a byword for disaster. Not surprising, especially when you take into account that 10 times more radiation was actually released at Chernobyl than in Fukushima. It happened during a routine reactor systems test on April 26, 1986. 
A sudden and obvious unexpected surge of power destroyed Unit 4 of the Soviet-era nuclear power plant. In the destruction and the fire which ensued, enormous amounts of radioactive material were released into the environment. Just as at Fukushima, there were desperate, concerted efforts to contain the situation. Helicopters flew over the burning reactor, pouring sand and boron from above. This was meant to douse the fire, halt any additional emissions of radioactive material and thwart further nuclear reactions. They also cut down and buried around a square mile of pine forest in the surrounding area to reduce contamination in the vicinity. And tens of thousands of people were evacuated from the region. Within six months of the tragedy and at great personal risk to the workers involved, a makeshift concrete cover was built over Reactor 4. The purpose of the so-called Chernobyl sarcophagus was of course to protect the environment, which was hoped it would do for decades to come. At an emergency meeting of the International Atomic Energy, Soviet officials presented their initial accident report. They estimated that radioactivity from Chernobyl would cause over 25,000 deaths over the following 70 years. A book, Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment, wrote by three eminent scientists, however, put the death toll at approximately 985,000. Directly after the meltdown, Soviet authorities sealed off the power plant within a 30-kilometer radius. Hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated, some directly after the incident, many more in following months and years. The new sarcophagus will be the largest movable man-made structure ever built on land. With radiation immediately above the reactor still much too intense for this new enclosure to be built over the top of it, nearby land was cleared and decontaminated. Новый безопасный конфаймент должны построить в 15 году. Поэтому всех в 15 году приглашаю сюда на площадку, чтобы посмотреть, как уже арка будет буду построена. However, these kinds of massive engineering works often encounter bumps in the road. The revised date for its completion is now November 2017. The IAEA doesn't actually keep a complete database of all the nuclear accidents to date. In 2011, however, the Guardian newspaper compiled a list of 33 serious incidents at nuclear power plants dating back to 1952. But nuclear power doesn't need to be involved for an industrial accident to have tragic consequences on an epic scale. A natural disaster, such as a volcano or earthquake, is something we have little to no control over. Safety in the workplace and care for the environment are a different story. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill, known also as the BP oil spill, began on the 20th of April 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. The Macondo Prospect was a BP-owned oil rig situated some 66 kilometers from the Louisiana coastline. On the evening of April 20th, a surge of natural gas blasted through a concrete core intended to seal the oil well for later use. The gas ignited on the oil rig's platform, killing 11 workers and injuring 17. On the morning of the 22nd, the entire rig capsized and sank. As it did, 
the so-called riser was ruptured. This critical piece of hardware is the pipe which connects an oil rig to an offshore oil well. With that, oil began to discharge into the Gulf of Mexico at an alarming rate. And indeed, this was to become the largest marine oil spill of all time. BP executives initially claimed the volume of oil escaping the damaged well was around 1,000 barrels per day. But US government officials claimed that the leak was more like 60,000 barrels of oil per day. Under intense but quite justifiable pressure from the US government, the local population, as well as environmentalists, and indeed the watching world, BP tried to seal the leak in various ways. First, the supposedly infallible blowout preventer malfunctioned. A containment dome in May didn't work either. A method called top kill, in which mud is drilled and pumped into the well, also failed to stem the flow. Eventually, a method called bottom kill was deployed, which involved pumping cement into the leaking well via two relief wells. I don't understand why it took 87 days. It affects our whole economy and our ecology. Well, it's about time. We should have had a backup plan from day one. In the five months since it began, it was estimated that 4.9 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf, with only 80,000 of those captured. It is hardly surprising then to say that the leak's environmental impact was catastrophic. Incalculable numbers of fish and thousands upon thousands of birds, mammals and sea turtles were plastered with oil. Heartbreaking pictures of these bedraggled and ailing animals flashed around the world. In 2014, a New Orleans district judge ruled that BP's gross negligence was chiefly responsible for the disaster, calling their conduct reckless. Of course, in an industrial accident, no amount of financial compensation will bring dead workers back to life or safeguard the environment from long-term consequences. Now, a house of cards. It might be a popular TV series, but you certainly wouldn't want to work in a real one. But in April 2013, in Bangladesh, thousands of factory workers found out that's exactly where they were toiling. The Rana Plaza in Savar, an industrial eyesore on the outskirts of the capital of Dakar, is where workers toiled away making Western designer clothing for as little as $40 a month. It sounds miserable enough, but the sweatshop conditions turned into a hell on earth when the building seemed to implode from within. Survivor accounts were similar to those of earthquake survivors. There was a loud cracking noise. The concrete floor under their feet began to shift, and then concrete pillars and beams collapsed under their own weight. Worse still, some workers had already expressed concern about cracks appearing in the walls of the building. Some of the offices and a bank had the sense to move their people out of there. But the factory workers were told if they wanted to hold on to their jobs, they would have to keep going to the factory. Oh 
আজকে সকাল বেলা উঠতে চাই নাই আমাদের সবাই উঠাইছে তো কোনো সমস্যা নাই যে আটটা চল্লিশ বাজে এমনি বিল্ডিং টাই পাই গেছে নিচের দিকে আমরা যে মেশিন দিয়ে উঠবো সেই শক্তিটা আমরা পাই নাই নিচের দিকে টাই পাই গেছে The search for the dead ended a month later, with a death toll of 1,129. Over 2,500 people were pulled out alive from the wreckage. The collapse has gone on record as one of the deadliest disasters in the history of the garment industry. But the factory collapse came only a few months after a factory fire in Bangladesh killed 112 workers all of them making shorts and sweaters for Western consumers. Disasters like the Savar Plaza building collapse only serve to illuminate the true cost of the high street bargain bin. Over 30 years after it occurred, the Bhopal gas disaster is still considered the worst industrial accident of all time. It was the result of negligence and incompetence on the part of a pesticide manufacturing company and government officials. It was in the early hours of the morning on December 3rd, 1984, that wind carried a grey cloud of poisonous gas from the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, India. Some 40 tonnes of the toxic gas, methysocyanate, or MIC, had been accidentally released from the plant, and it spread through the city, poisoning everything it touched. कि यहाँ के जो वाइटल इंस्ट्रूमेंट है जिससे पता चल जाए कि कंटामिनेशन है टेम्परेचर इंडिकेटर लगा वो काम ही नहीं कर रहा हमने रिपोर्ट किया कि ये फाल सिग्नल दे रहा है इसमें पांच डिग्री टेम्परेचर है और ये बीस बता रहा है वो नहीं वो फाल्टी है उसमें कुछ नहीं डोंट केयर अबाउट दैट इंस्ट्रूमेंट जबकि बहुत ही वाइटल इंस्ट्रूमेंट है तो इस तरीके के एम प्लांट में भी देखने को मिला तो यहाँ कई दुर्घटना होती थी तो यूनियन के थ्रू हम लोगों ने प्रोटेस्ट किया टू दिस डे there is disagreement about where and how the leak was sprung. Local activists and government officials contend that routine pipe maintenance created a backflow of water, which spilled into a tank of MIC. But Union Carbide Corporation contends water entered the tank after an act of sabotage. Whoever was ultimately responsible, the result was a nightmare without end. Over 10,000 people were estimated to have died outright. As residents woke up to clouds of the suffocating gas, they began running through the darkened streets to local hospitals. By the time they got there, out of breath and often blinded as well, the damage was already done. The muscles, brains, lungs and eyes the gastrointestinal, neurological, reproductive and immune systems of the survivors were affected. On the morning following the leak, the Bhopal streets near the gas plant were like a scene from a horror film, with the difference that the carnage and devastation was all too real. In many ways, uh, people are worse than they were on the morning of the disaster. There are at least 150,000 people with chronic illnesses as a result of their exposure to the toxic gases. And uh, now we know that the next generation is also marked by union carbide's poisons. To this day, December 3rd remains a day of mourning in the Bhopal province, and the environmental impact will take many, many years to be forgotten. So there you have it. There are disasters and there are tragedies. And in this installment of Desperate Hours, we have seen both. As we have touched on before, the effects of natural disasters can be heartbreaking, catastrophic, the source of so much human suffering. But it's the incompetence and greed, 
negligence and arrogance of man that makes these nuclear and industrial accidents so especially tragic. In the wake of such tragedy, there is always recrimination and pursuit of retribution. But often what has been lost can never really be recovered. And if that hasn't made you think twice about safety in your own workplace, we don't know what would.